Hey everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for September 19th, 2012. I'm Matt Gradwell from Uppercut Woodworks. You can find me on the web at uppercutwoodworks.com and you can find me on Twitter at Uppercut Wood. Um, today's Wood Chat is going to be focused on finishing. Uh, with here, as, with, here with me as always is Chris Wong. Chris? Hello everybody, I'm Chris Wong. You can find me at flarewoodworks.com and on Twitter at flarewoodworks. Our special guest today is Randy. Go ahead, Randy. You can introduce yourself. Okay. Um, well, I'm I'm privileged to uh, be among the greats here, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I I've been uh, doing woodworking for about oh, I'd say 30 years or so. I'm not a uh, professional woodworker, but I've uh, uh, I have a uh, engineering background and. Uh, uh, you know, woodworking really allows me to, you know, get some of that engineering uh, uh, desire out and being able to be creative and things like that. Um, uh, the last several years, I've been really uh, exploring spray finishing and and uh, finishing in general. And I have a uh, a blog page. Uh, it's uh, finewoodfinish.blogspot.com and you know, if you're interested, check it out. That sounds really interesting. I'll have to read that uh, later. I haven't been following your blog so far. That was Finewood Finishing. No, Finewood Finish. Dog. Blogspot. Dot com. Okay. And we brought Ra Randy in to talk uh, about finishing today. He and Matt. And as far as the word expert is concerned, um, I would say that um, I've got a method that works for me and that I like, and that I hate finishing a lot less than I used to. I actually enjoy it now. And it's much quicker and easier now um, that I've got a system down. So. so Randy, why don't you tell us kind of what you've been doing and experimenting with. You said you got into spray finishing uh, like in the last couple of years. Yeah, I've always been, uh, you know, concerned about finishing spray finishing in particular because when you read the uh, the books and there's actually very few books out there, you know, explaining how to do this. Uh, you know, they are talk about you have to have this big honking compressor, you have to have a spray booth and uh, uh, expensive spray gun, and uh, it, it sounded like a big deal, a big commitment to get into it, and so. Yeah. Um, you know, I decided just to try it out. Uh, I, I started small. I, my spray booth is a, a, a tarp that I drape over my table saw, and uh, you know that seems to work pretty well. And, and uh, I use uh, a, a eight gallon uh, compressor, and uh, it's working well. And uh, you know, a very inexpensive gun, and uh, you know I've been able to spray you know dyes. Uh, you know, shellac, uh, water-based finish, even paint. I've uh, needed to uh, paint our uh, dining room uh, chairs because they were all scraped up, and I, I needed to repair those. So, you know, I, I've been very pleased with the results so far. And so, you're doing HVLP conversion. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. And gravity fed. Yes. Okay. So the cup is on top of the gun. Um, your eight-gallon compressor delivers um, a low volume of high-pressure air. Your gun converts it into a high volume of low-pressure air. The benefits of that are less bounce back and more material actually landing on the wood. And you've been successful um, in spraying um, dyes, finish, and paint. Yes. And was that water-based paint? Yes. Uh, yeah. I yeah, used uh, uh, acrylic. So you've got into the world of different needle sizes then? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so just to tell you about my setup, um, my first spray gun was the Little Critter, the little $40 right. um, siphon gun that uses a mason jar and creates a large cloud in your, um, in your spray area. Um, now I use an Erlex uh, three-stage turbine, the 6900. I posted mm -hmm. a link to it in the... Um, uh, in the uh, Twitter feed, and I have also sprayed 
um, water-based finishes, dyes, uh, alcohol-based dyes, water-based dyes, and 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 paint, um, and absolutely love absolutely love spraying now um, and finishing now. Whereas before, it was a pain. For small projects, I still do an oil varnish blend, but for large projects, I spray. Uh, and I'm in the world of different needle sizes as well. Um, yeah, I, I've, uh, you know, I was trying to do dyes, uh, you know, by hand before, and, uh, you know, you, you, there's a lot of issues in terms of getting it, uh, you know, a uniform look across the, uh, off the wood, and, and so what I was doing was, uh, uh, you know, getting the entire piece of wood uh, wet and the, letting it dry, and, and sometimes that would work, and it was just very painful. And uh, I use uh, water-based dyes. Uh, I use the transdent uh, dyes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, it, it, when I spray it, you know, I, I, I can just do sort of a mist level, and it's just very uniform. I, I just love it. And then... Uh, when I was trying to brush shellac over the dye to protect it from the water-based uh, finish, uh, I would get different levels and stuff like that. It would dry mm -hmm. so quick, you know, I'd come back, and 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 that was painful too. And yeah. and I've been able to get around that issue. Yeah, a key thing to remember is that when you're using the transient dyes with alcohol, you're really just spraying um, alcohol that's been dyed with a dye that has very small molecules. When you're spraying the pre-canned, pre-mixed, general finishes, water-based dye stain, it's still a very small dye molecule, but there is a small amount of resins in there. So you're actually spraying a very light, uh, sorry, how do, how do I say this? A dye that's like, got think, finish in it and will actually set up. A, t a tinted uh, coat. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a very watered-down polyurethane hmm. with dye in it. Okay, so you, then you don't have to protect it with a shellac. Or you you still you still have to. Um, okay. It's it definitely doesn't have enough protection to be done. It's just for some reason general finishes puts a little bit of the resins in there. Um, I don't know if that's so that when you apply a water based finish over their water based dye, you don't get the muddiness and the lifting of the dye into the finish. Yeah. Um, I don't know why they do that. We tried to get them into the chat. That was my first thought too, Matt. That it wouldn't pick up the next time you put your coat down. Yeah, and so that's why when I, if I'm just gonna if I'm just gonna finish a piece of wood clear, um, I just use shellac as base coats, multiple coats of shellac as base coats. Is that uh, de-waxed, obviously, right? De-waxed, absolutely de-waxed, because it dries really fast. It imparts a nice color. Um, and I can spray multiple coats in a day and not have to worry about long dry time. Mm -hmm. I'll top it with a water base. If I'm going to dye, um, and I use the general finishes dye, I still put shellac over it so that because the shellac will sit on top of the dye and seal it down, and then the water base finish won't lift up the the dye. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting to, and I I don't you don't I don't always go water 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 water, and I don't always go alcohol 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 because I actually want the the different layers to not not. I don't want layer two to contain the solvent of layer one because I don't want it to dissolve the next one. So right. I don't want it to be compatible. Uh, question for you guys: Do you prefer water-based finishes for the most part? It sounds like, or do you use solvent-based as well? Aside from a shellac. So. If I had a spray room with a spark-free fan and appropriate ventilation, right. um, I might spray lacquer. Okay. But my spray setup is my garage, and so there's a whole. I did a video of this on my on my blog, but there's a whole um, square dance in my garage I have to do to get set up for spraying. So step one is I flip the switch on the furnace so that it's not pulling any air from the garage into the house. Mm -hmm. Then I um, move all my tools over to one side so that I have a big garage bay that's open. Then I spread out a, a very large cloth, drop cloth, on that side of the garage. I open the garage door partially. I have a 
uh, series of foam panels that can arrange. Uh, where's a good pen? Uh, where's a, and where's a piece of paper? I arrange a set of foam panels like this if you're looking from top down. Okay? Yeah. yeah. This is where my fan is. This is where the garage door is. And I have mm -hmm. a round table that's two rounds of plywood with that are mounted on two pipes that fit inside each other so it turns. The air is always going this way. And I'm always standing here. I never get air, I never get the blowback on my face. I can turn the piece. And then my sprayer is always here, and there's always an open door here. So I spray waterborne finishes. Waterborne finishes still contain a solvent. It's usually glycol ethers. Um, if I could, I might spray I might spray lacquer, but the waterborne finishes are really getting good. The general finishes in Durovar is really good. The target coatings, tinted lacquers, instead of painting, and you can get water-based, are really good. So I'm going to try and stick with water as much as possible, but I know that um, there's a lot of times when I do touch-ups and I use a rattle can of Jeff spray lacquer, and it's great. Yeah. It's <laughs> great. So... Right, and that's a, that's an easy way to get into spray finishing too. Just using an aerosol can, you don't need the set, you don't need the compressor or the gun or, or to clean the gun. You don't need to worry about thinning the finish. It's a really simple way to do a spray finish if you don't have a lot of uh, area to cover. Yeah. So talking about uh, rattle can finishes, um, you can actually get these little prevail um, charged aerosol things that sit on top of a jar. And so if you need to do a small project, you can use those. If you need to do on-job site touch-ups, you can bring a jar of that, and it's, just, it, it's like making your own aerosol can of whatever you want. Right. Um, and those are, those, are, those are great, and um, they're easy to find at Home Depot and, and things like that. So, um, But I want to make sure people understand that water-based finishes aren't really water-based. Mm -hmm. There's... Resins dissolved by with glycol ethers. Glycol ethers allow the rest of the mixture to be contained in a in a water mixture. So when you when you use lacquer thinner, when you use lacquer, the lacquer thinner dries and then the lacquer cures. When you use the wa when you use a waterborne finish, first the water dries, then the ethers evaporate and the finish cures. So Still nasty solvents in a waterborne finish. Mm -hmm. um, they're just not generally explosive, and they're generally less stinky. But you should still use a respirator and assume that there's bad juju chemicals in these finishes. Yeah, especially when you're spraying, you always want a respirator when you're spraying. Yeah, and and uh, Mark Spagnolo on the woodwhisperer.com did lots of videos. He's got a chemical background. He can explain all this stuff to you. Um, there's one a great one about dye called you and dye, um, but there's a lot a really a lot of really good resources out there. And for anything you're spraying, you can look up the MSDS, which is the Material Safety Data Sheet, to find out what's in it and how how bad it is. But I assume that everything I spray is is horrible, and so I make sure it doesn't go into the house. I make sure I have ventilation and airflow and a fan, and a respirator. And then. Um, there was one comment in the um, chat room about water-based finishes not leaving a good um, a warmth or a depth. Yeah, that used to be the case. And, and you can, and although the finishes are getting better, you can actually solve that if your base coats aren't water-based. So you can use shellac, or you can do a base coat of oil um, to impart that depth, and then just use the water-based stuff on top for protection. Cool. So, or the trans tent, you can uh, you know just uh, put a couple drops in your water base finish, and, yeah, right. uh, amber color, and uh, you'll get that amber glow. Um, so somebody had asked a question about what the what are the benefits of a turbine? Um, so I have a small pancake compressor, 
and so the turbine lets me. I can actually I could actually take my sprayer into a into a bedroom if I wanted, I, and I don't have to bring the whole compressor because the turbine is about as big as a uh, I don't know. It's about as big as a inkjet printer, I guess. Okay. I'm looking around my office, there's an inkjet printer. Yeah, um, and they're a, lot, they're a lot lighter too than a compressor. And they're a lot lighter than the compressor. They're still very noisy. Um, uh, the 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 conversion guns work great though if you have the right if you have the right compressor. So, um, what exactly is a conversion gun? I don't know that term. term. Randy, can you, can you talk about your setup? Yeah. Um, let me. Uh, so this is. Uh, can you see this? My this is my favorite gun. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, go back a little bit here, and it's just a uh, uh, what they call a touch-up gun. The uh, the the container on top holds about four ounces of uh, finish, and uh, it's usually more than enough. Uh, because what I like to do when I do uh, woodworking projects is I finish the uh, the pieces as I go, and, and you know as I assemble them. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, what I can do with this is, you know, especially in the dyeing and stuff like that, is uh, take advantage of that, uh, you know. Being able to clean this uh, gun very easy, it only takes minutes to do that. Um, now, with this, I I do have a uh, well. Let me show you my my booth here. Sure. So very fancy. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a tarp on top of my uh, uh, table saw, so okay. not too, not too fancy there. Um, let me go back here, and I'll show you uh, my compressor. So a conversion gun is a HVLP gun that can be used with a compressor instead of a turbine. Is that basically what it is? Well, I, I, I think the conversion is the fact that um, what's happening is that uh, uh, it converts from the uh, the high pressure, uh, low volume to the other way around. And okay. I, I don't even know if you can buy okay. any uh, 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 you know spray gun anymore that's not conversion really. So I, it's not a big deal. Right. And they're not expensive. You can get them. You can get a pretty good one, a a purple one at Harbor Freight. That's the people have used with success. But Randy, I saw. I think I saw your. Um, on your blog, you list that gun. That, that's that's not a very expensive gun, right? Oh no! I mean, uh, this this gun is, uh, you know, I, I actually needed to get an, another needle for this right here. Yeah. And uh, the needle was eight dollars, and I yeah. and I went to Amazon to get it. And when I received the uh, package, they sent me a whole gun. Wow. <laughs> How much was the How much is the gun if you, if you don't? If it's you don't only get, about. Uh, it's it's like uh, twenty six dollars or something like that. Okay. I actually I was looking for some spare parts and I uh, I found the outfit in China that had it and they sent me an email saying, well, uh, if I wanted to buy ten thousand of them, they would sell them to me for four bucks a piece. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna set up an online store selling those guns? <laughs> tell, tell them they have a deal if they include the compressor and free shipping. Well, my compressor's from China too. I mean, it's uh, yeah. it, it does a good job. It's a uh, oil-based. Uh, you know, it uses the oil in it. It's not one of these uh, oilless ones, and so it's it's it, you don't have to leave the room when it turns on. At least, I mean, it's pretty quiet. And the oil-based ones are, are the the ones that use oil are. Uh, it's supposed to be pretty reliable. Yeah. Now, do you filter your air? I see that you have a regulator, a pressure regulator, right at the base of your gun. Do you also filter the air? Well, I filter the air at the compressor. Okay. And I, so the compressor is is set to deliver about you know 60 pounds or something like that, and then uh, on the um, let me move back here. So I do have a regulator right here. And so that's set at you know between twenty or thirty uh, pounds. Okay. And the the other thing I recommend is that you have one of these locking 
regulators because uh, I kept bumping it and stuff like that, and then the you know everything mm -hmm. goes off. So this right. one right here has a you know goes you know uh, in and out here to lock it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the other thing that I've found out you know or, or just you know experimenting. So this thing at the bottom right here also allows you to change the air. Never change it. You know, just keep it in one spot. Yeah. Um, you know, and then on the other side here, this right here allows you to change the the spray pattern. And then when you spray, you you there's a the the capability of varying the uh, speed here, or the vary the the uh, the spray pattern and the rate. But right. the uh, most of the things that I've read about is this, you know, pull it back all the way because being able to replicate and, and, and being able to adjust that on the fly is just crazy. So just right. make all your setups and stuff like that and then just go across and do your spring. Yeah. There will be a control as to how far the trigger can come back and how much fluid you're putting out of the gun, right? Right. Now, when I do, uh, like, die, you know, uh, which is, you know, uh, just been dissolved in water. I have to use a, a very small um, uh, needle and uh, okay. and paint. Uh, so let me let me show on here. So right here, you know, that's where the you know the the fluid will come out. You know, mixed with the air, and the the smaller the diameter of this, you know, the the uh, the more viscous fluids you can you can still atomize. And so right. I use like a 0.8, you know, for for water or for dyes and stuff like that. A uh, a 1.2 for uh, for um, you know my water base finish and for the uh, shellac, and then I use a a, a 1.5 for paint. I guess we could go back and uh, explain that to get a proper a good finish, you need to atomize the finish. You need the air to break up the fluid so that it exits the gun in, I guess, small particles, and when it hits the surface, then it, um, what's the word, uh, coalesces? Yeah, you want a fine mist of small droplets that, um, where the droplets aren't so sparse that when they hit the material, you, you want, when the, when the, they want the droplets to land like this, and then eventually, as they, they you want them to kind of meet, right? There is a there is a, a problem that some people have when spraying called dry spray, mm -hmm. which is um, the droplets right. um, are not are not meeting, and so you end up with little droplets, and it feels like a very fine dry sandpaper. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a problem people have. But so in general, um, my rules of thumb when I spray are I use the smallest needle possible. Right. Um, so and I and the needle adjustment, you, you you can decide how far back the needle goes when you pull the trigger, and that controls the amount of fluid that comes out. I always start by cranking that in all the way, so I'm pulling it back. I'm, I'm, I'm retracting the needle as little as possible. Um, and then I, I open that up to get, to get it just right. Um, I had lots of problems when I first started spraying of trying to put all the material on at once. Right? Can't I just do one coat that's an eighth of an inch thick? <laughs> Have it be perfect, right? And yeah. and it's better to do many fine coats. You get much less dripping and sagging and running. Mm -hmm. um, and but you don't want dry spray. So there's a sweet spot, and the best way to find the sweet spot for me is smallest needle, least amount of fluid, and then open it up from there to where I'm getting something good. Right. Because um, my an experiment on a. Uh... I, I, I get a piece of cardboard and I uh, uh, you know will spray across it and uh, you know you just get a sort of a feeling of you know if it's coming out okay and then a very bright light I, I bounce off of my work so I, I make sure that I you know not uh, missing spots that I, I'm getting a real you know that the, the piece is staying wet I mean this dry spray problem is is when the the particles are are in fact drying as they they hit the piece of wood itself, yeah. and and it, uh, you're not getting a uniform uh, coating across it. So, you know, you just you know experiment for a, a bit, and it, 
I mean, I picked it up real quick. I mean, you, you just you sort of, uh, you, you may want to, you know, take a look at, at a book or something like that. I use uh, Jeff Jewett's uh, fine, uh, yeah. let's see, spray finishing made simple. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. And uh, you know, he has a lot of you know, troubleshooting uh, tips in there on, uh, well, if it's, you know, it feels rough, then you're doing this. One of the better ones. Yeah. One question we had in the chat room from John, um, who's posting as Mylins USA. Um, are you sanding between coats? So, I guess to expand on that, when when is it required to sand between coats, and when isn't it required? You want to start with that, Randy? Well, um, so I, I'll put on the dye. And uh, uh, right after that, I'll, I'll use the, the, the shellac. And so okay. you, you don't want to do any sanding on the die. You know, and, and if you had uh, you know, sufficiently sanded the piece you know, before you started the dyeing, you sh shouldn't have any bumps or anything anyway. So uh, when you get the, to the shellac, uh, uh, when you put the shellac on, I may use either uh, some red or gray. Uh, you know the synthetic uh, sandpaper, uh, just a very light buffing to make sure that it's flat. And then when I do the uh, the water-based uh, finish, um, you know I, I usually try to you know do two or three coats uh, you know pretty rapidly. If you let it uh, dry overnight before you do the successive coats, and then at that point what you want to do is uh, again maybe use like the maroon. A sanding pad to yeah. create a uh, a little. Uh, uh, you want the way the water-based uh, finishes uh, adhere. They they want to grip onto the previous coat. So if you do it, uh, you know, pretty rapidly, you know, uh, you won't need to do that. But if it dries, you're going to have to make a, a sort of a, a rough surface uh, to it to to be able to adhere and, and not peel yeah. off. So Randy, now, Randy's, Randy's spot on there. So if you spray two coats of lacquer, okay. the second coat will actually burn into the first coat, and it actually becomes mm -hmm. one thick coat. But when you do two water-based yeah. coats, they actually the top coat is actually a separate coat that wants to stick to the lower coat. And so if you if you rough that up, and you don't have to go crazy. If you just rough it up, it just helps it hold better. Um, now I think. On on the label of the finishes, water based finishes, I think I've read that you only need to sand between coats if you waited twenty four hours or something like that. Yeah. Have you heard that? Um I've seen I've seen that recommendation and hmm. it's basically because if the first if the if the first coat is fully cured, right. then the second coat is gonna have less less of an opportunity to con con to kind of um congeal into the first coat. Okay. Um and so then you would want to, and so it'll be harder because it's okay. it's cured more, and so you want to rough it up. Okay. Um, but remember, there's a there's a difference between dry and fully cured. There's yeah. There's there's dry to the touch and and dry enough that you can work on it, and then there's really fully cured at its at its full hardness. So yeah. Um, I I don't like sanding, so I try and minimize it as much as possible, especially sanding the inside corners of cabinets. With my stumpy nub fingers, so I try and pre-sand my parts. Um, once I've dry fit and I think, okay, I'm ready to assemble, I'll pre-sand my parts as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I won't. I don't. I don't typically do a water spray to raise the grain because my first coats are usually um, going to be shellac, and so I'll spray a first coat of shellac. I might right. spray a second coat. Then I'll do a light sanding, and then from then on, I really don't have to do much, right? Because the okay. alcohol makes the the alcohol makes the fibers grow or swell just a little bit, mm -hmm. and I'll sand that down like with a 400, and I'll do it by hand, not with a machine, and I'll wipe it off, um, and I'll usually wipe it off with a rag wet with water because I know that the water won't 
reactivate the shellac. Um, the water that I wipe it off with, make sure that the dust sticks to the rag, and and, and it's not a it's not a soaking wet rag; it's just a damp rag. Mm -hmm. And then when that's dry, I start spraying more shellac. <laughs> just spray, spray, yeah. spray, 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 spray. Yeah. And then um, before I spray the the final top coat, which is usually Endurovar, if there's any sanding that need to be needs to be done, I I do that. Sometimes it's just usually with a, like a white pad, and there, you know mm -hmm. if there's any nibs or anything like that. Um, then I'll spray my enduro bar. Uh, then when that when that's dry, a lot of times I'll be done. I only spray one water-based top coat because I have four or five coats of shellac below that. I have had problems where sometimes I'll have a run, and what I'll typically do is um, using a very sharp bench chisel, I will pare off the run very delicately and carefully because if you sand a run you're just going to create more problems for yourself so I try and cut it off and then <laughs> after it's cut off I will sand and just do a touch up in that spot. Why do you use the multiple coats of uh, shellac? Um, if, it, especially if I'm doing a tabletop and I want to protect something um, I'll spray multiple coats of shellac instead of the water base because it dries so fast Right, and then I but then I want a different top coat that's alcohol resistant, so that if somebody sets down a wine glass or a beer, or a cocktail, it won't it won't um, reactivate the it won't thin the shellac. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's it's I'm literally optimizing for being lazy and wanting to be done with finishing quickly. Okay. Right. So I don't like to sand, so I try and pre-sand as much as possible. Um, I don't like to spray a first coat that's water-based because it really grows the wood and swells the wood, and then I have to re-sand everything. <laughs> um, I spray shellac because I can spray multiple coats in a day. If I had a full spray booth set up, I might switch that to lacquer and then be done. Um, I'll spray maybe one or two coats of shellac before sanding to a very high grip to make sure it's glass smooth. Then I'll spray more coats of shellac without sanding in between. Um, I'll check for nibs, but usually usually things are pretty good. Um, then I'll wipe down with a white pad and clean up any dust before I spray my final top coat, my Endurovar top coat. And I would use Endurovar for all the coats, except it's expensive and it takes longer to dry than shellac. Mm -hmm. So I'm literally optimizing for being done. How do you pick uh, the water-based finish that you like? I mean, what, what kind of criteria do you use? Um, so I have sprayed the Minwax water-based poly. I've sprayed General Finishes High Performance and some other polys. The reason I really like the Endurovar is because, and I, I can't explain the chemical reaction here, but um, it's a water-based finish that does cross-linking. And from what I understand, that's in the way when the resins cure how the molecules align. And so I have seen, um, so like I said, my tendency is to always overspray to try and just get it all done. And I have mm -hmm. seen cases where I've sprayed too much Endurovar, but as it cures and dries, the problems that I think I'm going to have flatten out and fix and just end up smooth. So I've seen inside corners where there's a puddle, and it just, it just like it just like fixes itself, and so, and I really like the fact that the Endurovar um, has got a little bit of a warmer tone to it, and less of a milky, whitey, plasticky feel to it. Um, mm -hmm. I've sprayed Endurovar on raw walnut, and um, it looked really, really good. And but I have I have had one problem that I want to make sure everybody's aware of. Um, Endurovar, so there's exothermic reactions and endothermic reactions, ones that um, give off heat, and, and, and they do that by consuming oxygen and things like that. So whatever, that's chemistry talk, and I don't even know if I'm getting it right. What I found with the Endurovar was that when I sprayed end grain, it sucked oxygen out of the wood straws into the finish, and I had little, little, tiny, tiny bubbles. And it almost looks like I had um, 
put a very fine glitter in <laughs> in the finish, and it, it killed me because I, I had sprayed a, a whole series of trophy bases. I had to sand off the enduro bar and seal the end grain with lacquer, um, <laughs> and then I was fine. So enduro like. If you read the general finishes page on Endurovar, it it consumes oxygen to do its curing, um, and it was consuming the oxygen from inside the wood fibers, and that really caused a problem on end grain, on edge grain or face grain. It was no problem, but it literally pulled the air out of all these little straws and deposited it in the clear coat, and it looked horrible. I use uh, polyacrylic. And uh, uh, you know it, it, it's inexpensive. Uh, you yep. know Sherman Williams puts it on sale occasionally. I think they have like a forty percent off sale right now, and so I, I picked up like four cans of it. And, and uh, yeah, I, you know the uh, the multi link uh, capability. I, I understand that that's very resistant to uh, you know uh, you know like I said uh, you know beer and wine and things like that. Trying to yeah. eat it things like that. Not, so I haven't you know, really played with that too much, but uh, that has, you know, a lot of merit. Yeah. So, Chris, people had asked about steel wool. Yeah, um, I started with that. <laughs> uh, I don't use real steel wool. I use the fake steel wool. Um, yeah, you, too you many reasons. Yeah, you, um, you mentioned the one thing that I have a problem with is the little particles left behind. Yes. So, um, I live in Seattle, so steel wool rusts, <laughs> right? And um, so I don't like that. The other problem is, uh, well, actually, two problems. I don't like the particles that get left behind, and I don't like um, I don't like that if I use steel wool without gloves. Sometimes I get little tiny micro uh, impalements, right? Splinters. I get, like, splinters. Steel splinters, yeah. yeah. And so I um. I buy the green and white, maroon, gray, fine, extra fine pads, like in bulk, and I just use those. Hey, Todd's here. <laughs> Hello, Todd. Good to see you, Todd. Cool. Wow, right on. You're here, man. All right. Uh, we were just talking about the use of steel wool and how I prefer synthetic steel wool over real steel wool. Well, uh, you use uh, waterborne finish, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, you need you you need to stay away from the steel wool. Yeah, I I also don't like the little particles it leaves behind. Right. Well, synthetic steel yeah. wool tends to do the same thing. I feel I feel like they're easier to remove because they they're less likely to be sharp and stick themselves in. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. So Todd, tell us about pressure pots. Um, I know they're great, and someday I will use one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, uh, let me ask you this: Can I get? Can I put a picture on of a pressure pot? Yep. So up at the top left, there's a screen share button that will let oh. you choose. Um, that will let you choose whatever window you want to screen share. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, I can usually you open up the photo in a photo viewer, make yeah. the photo as big as you can, choose screen share. It'll list that the photo viewer application. Pick that, and you're good to go. Oh, okay. Um, the uh, uh, well, I'll let, let me let me. I, first of all, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out too many things at once here. Um, I use a pressure pot. Um, Sherwin, I, I do most of my shopping for my finishes at the Sherwin Williams Pro Store. So uh, when I was shopping for um, a sprayer. Uh, some you know, there's other pros in the sh in the store there, and they had recommended that that I take a look at the pressure pot um, because because I spray a lot of lacquer, and I I typically am spraying uh, precat lacquers, uh, Sherwin Williams or M L Campbell's, and M L Campbell's is my favorite. But at yeah, any you rate, you told me about the Campbell's. You love yeah, that yeah, I love M L Campbell's, and um, you know one of the problems I run into in my shop when I chose my finish was that waterborne finishes don't dry very fast at 60 degrees in my shop and I have to heat the shop up uh, for such a long period of time for like a day to get a waterborne finish to dry and I still can't get it as many coats as I can with solvent lacquers so as, at this point as long as solvent lacquers are legal to use I'm using them yeah but um 
uh, at any rate, when I was looking at the pressure pots, the, or when I was looking at uh, finishing uh, uh, systems, I stayed away from the HVLP based on what the other professional finishers and painters were telling me. And one of the problems that you continually have with an HVLP is that it blows a high volume of warm air and you get a lot of uh, a rough finish uh, due to that and, and it, it creates some problems in and of itself. Um, yeah, it's, I, I do have an HVLP for spraying latex in a house and I still can't, I still will end up uh, painting the last coat on to get it to smooth out. But uh, the pressure pump, uh, one of the great... The dry spray problem with the HVLP if the air is too hot. Oh, well, see, right. you can't, you know, you can't control the, the air temperature. The machine runs at whatever the machine runs at. Yeah, I've found that my machine blows hot air, um, much like myself, mm -hmm. um, if the filter's clogged. Oh, no, my filters are clean. I'm, like, super, uh, super good at all my machine maintenance. Um, uh, mm. there's, there's very few people that do as much maintenance on their tools as I do. Um, that's an old military thing, you know. You take care of your. Can you tools visit my make... shop and bring bring your <laughs> mile indicator? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, one of the benefits with the pressure pot, uh, and every every system does have its advantages and disadvantages as well. But what I like about the pressure pot is I can I just um, I I thin my material a little bit for spraying, and then I leave the material in there, and and all you got to do is open the pot, stir the material close the pot, hook it to the compressor, and start spraying. And there's no can attached to the gun. Right. So you just, you just got a couple hoses, and I run those along my arm. And I can spray upside down. Uh, it has a smaller profile, so it fits in tighter places. And then I can spray anything down uh, from about a, a, a quarter or 50 cent piece up to about 10 inches wide. I mean, you can spray a car with this thing. Yeah. Uh, you, you could do an automotive finish. But... Uh, when I'm done and put it back in the corner where I, I keep the system because there's nothing and there's nothing to clean up so you save time also you're not using up uh, as much solvent by by not having to clean all the equipment out and the so material doesn't dry lacquer, in the hose you, you can leave it your lacquer in the pot sorry you can leave your lacquer in the pot in the hose in the gun come back the next day you might have to take a nib off the end of the gun stir the pot and just go yeah Wow, That's pretty cool. Yeah, in fact, I don't even have to take a nib off the end of the gun because the only time you might get a little bubble of a nib of finish on the end of it is if, if like, between coats I leave the uh, compressor hooked up to it and the pressure forces a little bit of fluid out. Gotcha. You know, what it's doing is it's the pressure pot. The, the great thing about it is is that you can reduce the amount of air needed to atomize the material due to the fact that there's fluid being forced out of the pot, which is under pressure. So there's there's pressure in the kettle, forcing the fluid out to the gun, and so it's not gravity fed, and and uh, the it's not trying to siphon the material there. It's it's being pushed out under pressure, and then all you got to worry about is atomizing it, and you can you're not trying to atomize it and siphon it and all those things at once with that same amount of air at the gun. So um, that's you know. Um, where uh, even though I'm, it's a basically a conventional gun, but it's hooked up to a pressure pot system, and the way that it's fed, then you don't have quite as much overspray as a typical gun if it was a siphon feed or a gravity feed. Right. Wow. So question there. What are the two hoses for? Well, one, one is your air supply to the gun. You hook up one, your, your main supply hose from the compressor is hooked to the pressure pot, and then it splits. And part of it pressurizes the pot to push the fluid out, and then the other. Uh, so, so one hose is your your fluid hose uh, for your finish, and then one hose goes to the gun to atomize the finish. Uh, you know, is for the atomization. Okay. What pressure is that fluid coming out at? Uh, I have both the pressure pot and the gun set at about 30 psi. Okay. Hmm. Okay. And, and my gun is considered a conventional gun. And I don't know if any of you guys know of uh, Brian. Um, uh, yeah, he was in your shop, and you yes. put him to press the pot. I just dropped his name. Um, I'm, I'm so bad at this, too. Brian, uh, it's, I know Brian. Um, yeah. yeah, Brian Havens. Yeah, there you go. So, 
so anyways, Brian was so impressed with how easy it was for me to, to, to stir up the pot and just start spraying and then push it back in the corner when we were done. He was so impressed with that. He bought a system himself, but what he bought was a CRP gun. It's, it's conventional reduced pressure, or CPR, conventional pressure reduced. And it is it, it meets the standards for and actually exceeds the standards for what's considered to be the efficiency of an HVLP. So he's getting he's getting uh, uh, HVLP performance out of out of his pressure pot system compared to me. And he said there's a noticeable amount of of uh, reduced overspray. Wow. Okay. So ballpark. If somebody was going to get the compressor, well, actually, let's talk about the compressor first. How big of a compressor is really required? You have to maintain 30 psi. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so you're not talking a huge compressor here. No, actually, uh, what's kind of funny is uh, it's been two years now. I had a 25 gallon five horse uh, compressor, and yeah, that's, a, that's a big compressor. Yeah, so so it's 25 gallons of air uh, with a five horse motor on it. Now, if you take 25 gallons and you only have a three horse motor or a two horse motor, you don't get as much. Um, um, uh, you know your CFMs aren't going to be as high. Every time you you stack more horsepower on that compressor, you get a larger volume uh, uh, CFM rating out of it. And yeah. um, man, I can't remember. I think it was uh, it was rated at maybe maybe six or seven, no, what was it six or seven uh, CFM at at like ninety um, psi. You know, because there's like they rate them at 90 psi and at 40, and of course at 40 you get more CFM than you do at 90 right. uh, because they can't keep up with it. But anyways, what happened is the 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 short of that is that compressor died, and and I have a a, a Porter Cable uh, twin two gallons, so it's a total of four gallons. It's it's two hot dog compressor right. tanks, you know, stacked, and but it has a two horsepower motor and it puts out at like uh, six CFM. And it is a, uh, it's not a hobby. It is, you know, more like a professional. Um, um, kind of like a job site nail gun. Pan yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a real durable compressor. Well, it turns out I've been spraying all my projects for the last two years with that thing, and it keeps up. So, you know, if Does you got. Does it kick on when you're spraying? What's that? Does it kick on when you're spraying? Oh, yeah, it runs all the time. Okay. <laughs> but you yeah. haven't noticed. Um, you haven't noticed a, a degradation in your ability to, to, to spray? No. Actually, um, what I notice is it just runs constantly, but that little compressor keeps up. And if you think about it, though, most, most things, unless you're spraying large dining room tables, you can spray, um, which would require you to spray continuously nonstop to, to keep an even, you know, to keep your finish real even. Um, uh, I've I've not had any problems even spraying bookcases because the typically you can spray a side, stop, let the compressor catch up, go around and spray another side. Yeah. Pause, let it come catch up. You know, and so I, I I'm real good at being able to break all my projects up. Yeah. To, to method a, a spray pattern that that will allow the compressor to keep up. Okay. So uh, let's say somebody's interested in, in a pressure pot setup with the CPR gun. Ballpark. What 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 are we talking? A um, well, funny thing. Hundred bucks? No, they're they're about seven hundred dollars. Um, um, the pot, the hoses, the gun, the needles. Yeah. Now here's the thing. I paid. Uh, I've had mine about twelve years now, and I paid six hundred and fifty bucks for it twelve years ago. And uh, when Brian Havens bought his, he got the pressure pot, the hose, the gun, and an extra set of hose. Be because I told him, uh, because we'll run our clear lacquers through one hose dedicated to clear lacquers, and then the other hose is dedicated to colored lacquers. Right. And and, um, wow. and he paid seven hundred dollars, I think, total for for the whole set, which is basically what I've paid. Okay. And then now keep in mind, I've, I've I've dramatically reduced the amount of cleanup I have, so I'm I'm spending less in lacquer thinner, and so is he. And right. pressure pot or with the pot life of uh, your finish being three months to six months and he's you know he doesn't spray as much as I do so he's you know you you basically he's not losing his his uh, finish and I'm not losing mine and 
and uh, you know there's just less change out. There's a lot less. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more effective uh, yeah. for cleanup and and for setup when it comes to spraying. Mm -hmm. So you lose a lot less time. That that sounds pretty good, Todd. Um, like seven hundred is about the price of uh, probably the pr price of your HVLP, right, Matt? Yeah, that's what I. That's and and my HVLP is considered low end when you compare it to like yeah. the, the Fuji QX4. That that's more yeah. expensive than a pressure pot setup. So it, it, yeah, it, you know if you ha if you already have a compressor that can power it, it might be it might be a yeah. good deal. Right, a lot of guys may have a compressor already that can power that. Now let me yeah. ask you. This. Now the one, the one, the one thing is, it obviously it can't spray latex. It uh, that that gun is designed more for finishes. Now it, it can spray waterborne finishes, but if you do that, you have to get you have to invest in a pressure pot that has stainless steel parts in it because the dip tube uh. in mine. I've used it for I've run waterborne finishes through mine. But I can't really leave them in there because the steel dip tube. So, so if I wanted to to uh, start using specifically waterborne finishes, I would need to get a pressure pot that has yeah. that's rated for waterborne finishes. Hey Todd, somebody's asking from the chat room. Any opinions on pre-cat lacquer versus conversion varnish? Oh, you know what? Um, yeah, pre-cat lacquers are great uh, because because I can you get them pre-mix at the store and they've got a pot life that they'll tell you it's only three months. But if you keep it in a cool place in your shop, you can get three months to six months out of it. Mm -hmm. So if you're not using it professionally like I do, now keep in mind I'm not a cabinet shop. I do remodel and I sell all my projects through my remodel. But anyways. Uh, I use mine on a pretty regular basis, so I get good turnover. So, anyways, with your pre-cat lacquers, they're mixing it at the store. You got a decent shelf life out of it, and um, the conversion varnish is going to be a much harder finish and much more durable uh, and and resilient to to chemical and heat and and acids and all those things that 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 are hard on a finish. But you have to mix that finish right when you use it. So um, that's that's one finish, but I've used those two and I love them because of their durability. However, um, mm -hmm. what I did find was uh, through some testing of my uh, my own and through recommendations from other furniture makers and refinishers, is I got led on to M. L. Campbell's Magnamax, and um, Magnamax and Duravar is another one. I believe it I believe it's Duravar. Anyways, those two finishes are rated for kitchen and bath um, cabinetry right out of the can as a pre cat. Yeah. I think and, that's, I think it's Duralac. Duralac, thank you, thank and, you. And Duralvar is general finishes water based, um, yeah. water based stuff. Duralac is the ML Campbell. You yes, you are correct. I thanks. I get a lot of crap going through tinted. my head as I'm you know I'm trying to remember everything on it. Yeah. All this stuff is tinted as well, right? Yeah. So anyways, um, they they're a, they've been some of the most durable uh, pre cat lacquers that I've I've found uh, so far. And and so um, what I also what I, what I like too is a product I can put in the pressure pot. I leave it in there, and I don't need to use anything else underneath of it. It's considered a self sealing finish, um, and so so I can just spray a thin coat on it. Self seals the wood, and then I just keep spraying it for the consecutive coats. I don't I don't have to use multiple products. Gotcha. Have you have you done much tinting of lacquer? Yeah, I've done some tinting, and. And uh, what I find, though, it's better to it's better to to do. Um, um, I'm sorry. It it it's better not to tint the lacquer. It's actually better to do um, um, some toning and then and then put put your seal coats on top of that. So the problem is this: you if, toning. What do you do? Well, when when you do your tie on. And and typically, of course, because I'm using pre-cat lacquers, my my uh, carrier for the dye is going to be lacquer thinner. And what I'll do is I'll seal the surface uh, slightly, and then I put the toner on, and the toner will bond to that that first coat of lacquer because it's that film's already there. Now the the toner itself, um, I'll sometimes put just a little spot of finish in it to give it a little bit of some solids in there, and give it some stick. But you don't actually have to do that. But when you put that toner on, you're not you're building color, but you're not building any film finish at all. Right. The problem is this: if you if you if you 
tint your lacquer and you're trying to get to achieve a certain color but there's not enough color in the lacquer then you'll you'll build too much lacquer and yeah, your okay. your finish will look like crap because then it looks like plastic and it is because it's too thick and then the the if you if you achieve your color and your finish is thick the problem with lacquer is over the years as it continues to dry out it'll crackle it gets that alligator effect um, in the yeah. finish so you use uh, like a trans tint dye that's in lacquer thinner to to hone your wood or well I'll use I certainly have used the trans tint dyes and I like them um, but uh, I've also used uh, Sherwin Williams I'll buy the uh, court and they they cost about a hundred dollars for a court but um, uh, you know it's it's concentrated just like the trans tint dye and when you break the cost down per per ounce. Uh, it's cheaper to buy it by the quart for ninety-five dollars than it is to buy two ounces for eighteen or twenty-one dollars. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and um, so then also what I like using is uh, microtone dyes or microton dyes from M L Campbell's. Comes in a gallon. It's already mixed with acetone, so it's not a concentrate. But the great thing about it is acetone will bond to anything because yeah. um, you know, uh, universal. You, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I really like using the microton dyes from uh, from M L Campbell's as well. Okay. So you're spraying lacquer and acetone. So you 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 must have some kind of ventilation setup that you do, or at least opening doors. Open a window. <laughs> or are you smoking a smoking a pipe while you do this? <laughs> yes. Well, the first thing I do is I shut my furnace off. <laughs> yes. You know what? Here's the thing. In in Montana, um, you know, I spray a project, but I don't. I'm not a heavy. I'm not a heavy producer. And right now, I'm still actually. What's supposed to be my finish room is a storage room till I can finish the garage. Uh, the recession hit, and we took a bad hit, so uh, I wasn't able to finish the garage, so we can move all the crap out of there into the garage. And so my my finish room is actually acting as a storage room right now. <clears throat> but I have plans for a ventilation system up to set up but right now I just spray in the open shop and um, uh, and and I'll just open the windows and dump the air in the winter even when it's I, I've sprayed when it's minus 5 or minus 15 outside and uh, um, basically I'll turn I'll turn the furnace off when I spray and I'll spray for a couple minutes and once I get done spraying that coat, I'll open the windows and doors on each side of the shop. I'll dump the air out, which only takes a, a few minutes, and then shut the shop back up. And basically, I've had an air exchange, but you know, the the everything in the shop's not losing its heat value yet right. at that point. So then I, I close it back up and I turn the furnace back on, and there's not a problem. Okay. Okay. I wouldn't, even though I do this professionally, I would not consider myself at this point a high volume finisher. So, you know, because I'm not even using, you know, I might use a gallon, you know, in a couple days or two gallons in a week, and then I won't use a gallon for two months. Right. And, you know, and that's the great thing about the pre cat then. Of course, I just leave it in the pressure pot. If I need to spray something smaller, go on to a next big project, then I just pull it out and I start using it. It's yeah, just, that's, it's just yeah. there. That sounds great because one of the greatest deterrents I have for spraying is having to set it up and then spray it, and you have to clean up afterwards, and it's just a pain. It's not worth it. Yeah. Right. Often. You're right. Well, I'm telling you, you know, for for the money you'll spend on a pressure pot system, the setup and the cleanup time is so minimal, it, it will mm -hmm. pay for itself if you're doing this, you know, semi professionally or, or as a serious hobbyist. It's. It, it's such a great investment. You'll lose. You'll use less. Um, you will uh, uh, end up purchasing less lacquer thinner and solvents, and you'll spend so much less time for your setup and cleanup. It's you, it's 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 silly not to use it. Yeah, it's, it sounds great. Do you ever um, do you ever finish a project after dry fit but before assembly? Oh yeah, sure. You know, uh, sometimes you just gotta. You know, when I tape off those parts, I gotta get the glue on them. Yeah. You know, what I do is I'll pre-finish it, and then uh, put it together. Makes it easy to wipe the squeeze out off. Yeah. Uh, because it's sealed, and then I'll do a final coat or two uh, at the end, and it just pulls it all together. Yeah. I find that, uh, especially if the, especially if the piece is a case that has a lot of inside, inside pieces, mm -hmm. sometimes just better to. 
to, to do as much pre-finishing as possible. I've even done parts where I pre-finish, I get the board done, I finish it, then I cut the joinery. Like if I'm going to do something like a, a, a wine cabinet where I've got lots of boards yeah. joined together. Yep. Um, and I might even, um, after, the, after I finish the board, I let the finish cure. I might put some blue tape on the board so that, so that the finish doesn't get scratched. Cut all the rabbits and dados, take the uh. tape off, and then assemble it. Oh, wow. Uh, got a finish on there that's not scratched <laughs> um, because taping off all the little dados and rabbits and whatnot is just going to be a, a pain. Yeah. Um, blue, blue tape is my best friend right now. Got a question for you, Todd. Yeah. This setup you have that you've been talking about sounds, sounds great in every way. Why isn't it more popular? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you exactly why I think it's not very popular. I'd never even heard of it till 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 I was talking with other professionals. You know, really, what you see selling a lot of, and I, I'm not knocking anybody here. Right. Uh, it not not anybody on an individual basis or even the magazines. But what you see is what sells is what everybody talks about. If the magazines talk about an Earlex sprayer, then everybody buys an Earlex sprayer. Yeah. Um, like me. It, it's funny because when I I get a you know because I answer a lot of questions, I get a lot of private emails, and and I'm always helping guys. And what I find is I'm fighting the advice that I give. I'm constantly fighting the general information that's just being fed by the magazines. And and nobody talks about how great a pressure pot is. And so so it's very difficult for guys because they're like, oh, I'm getting all this information about you know the the Earl X uh, HVLP, you know, from Rockler, well, it, that HVLP may be fine, and I understand it's also hitting a price point that's attractive, and 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 there be they would even be willing to to admit that it's not the same as a fifteen hundred dollar, you know, professional HVLP gun. However, um, what they're they're hearing me talk about a pressure pot, and I'm the only person that's ever mentioned a pressure pot, so they they have a hard time. Right. Uh, believing, wow, you do great work, Todd, but you're talking about a pressure pot, and the magazines never talk about a pressure pot. Yeah. Nobody in the wood chat ever talks about pressure pots. Mm -hmm. So, man, I think I'm going to go with the Earlax. Yeah. Okay, well, whatever. Okay. And then they call me back. Yeah, I'm, I'm having problems with all this dry fall, and it, it dries in the air, and, well, you know, what they yeah. tell you? <laughs> yeah. okay. you know? So, Todd, where can someone find more information about this uh, the pressure pot in your setup? Um, you know, the best thing to do is go to ML, or not ML Campbell's, um, go to, uh, well, actually, ML Campbell's uh, actually does kind of endorse the pressure pot systems, but it wasn't through them. It was actually Sherwin-Williams, and, okay. and I, I found mine, you know, there's a pro store that tends to cater to the pro guys, and then there's the, 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 the regular public store, and both of those stores have pressure pot systems in them along with their airless sprayers. Uh, so they're pretty readily available, but um, uh, the the place to go to is CA Technologies. I have a CA Technologies um, um, uh, system, and it's mostly the gun. The pressure pot looks like it could have, you know, they're getting them from wherever. They all look the same, uh, pretty close. But anyways, uh, the CA Technologies gun is the is what you want to get. That's that's where the magic happens. Is in that gun. Okay. And uh, you can find CA Technologies at spraycat.com. Oh, really? I'll, I'll have to look that up. I, I look for CA Technologies, well, it looks and they're, like you're right. they're a business management company, so it's spraycat.com. Yeah, I'm going to look into this uh, over the next little while. Okay. I Yeah, I, I usually um, grab the link, and then I send it to guys. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's it. You got it. I just clicked on your link. That's that's it. And in fact, let me see. Um, oh, in fact, right on that home page, do you say CSS CPR? Uh, yep. There's in in the middle, yeah. down at the bottom, it says yeah. CPR, CAT mm -hmm. pressure reduced. That's the gun okay. that. If you click on that gun, you'll go to. Uh, it'll say compliant CPRG. 
Yeah. Uh, it's a pressure reduced fine finish gun. That's what uh, Brian Havens has. And then my gun is a uh, is just a conventional gun. And I'm going to see if I can find it real quick for you. It's up yeah, on I think my it's under the FE line. Here on yeah. the screen share. Mine's mine's a Lynx. And and if you let me see. I'm past the seven o'clock mark, but we can yeah. Links. We're past the seven o'clock mark, but we can keep going for a little while here. One thing I'm noticing with these guns, which I guess it's obvious when when you think about it, but um, there's no container that's attached to the gun, so the gun's lighter. Right. Well, right. You you're not you're not going to have problems with the gun. Oh, look at you! You got the stuff going on the screen there, man. You that's awesome. Um, Link CA Technologies gun. I'm putting this in the. Uh, let's see. Okay, I, I just posted a link, okay. and you'll see my links gun is at the top of the page there. I'm still trying to figure some things out here, so. Yeah. Now, I'm looking at the weights. I'm looking at the no, weights Randy, of the guns. So yeah. let me ask. I, you know, I've been dispensing all this information, but I got to know you guys. So, so actually, both the Randy and Chris, you guys work professionally too, right? No, um, I'm just yeah. a hobbyist myself. Oh, okay. Serious hobbyist or hobby yeah. hobbyist or? Yeah, well, serious hobbyist. Uh, I've been doing this for about 25 to 30 years, and I've entered uh, uh, some competitions with my pieces and things like that. And oh, cool. Yeah. You know, that's so, that's so important to your growth, too. I mean, I, I, I try to press that to the guys, and they're like, how do you do this? Well, it's, you got to get off your butt, number one, and spend more time in the shop. Yeah. And number two is, is to push your boundaries, is to, to get involved in and start competing and putting it out there and see see how it stacks up to other guys. Mm -hmm. But then, Chris, you you're doing it professionally, aren't you? Yeah, I'm still working to get myself established, though, too. Yeah. Well, you know, here's the thing. Uh, you know, I always I always tell everybody this, and and people only see the 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 you know the glitter, but the yeah. The, yeah. The reality is, you know, I, I sell my projects through my remodel. So so there's a lot of grunt work going on that a lot of guys wouldn't do uh, yeah. in order for me. To, here's the thing. If I'm the remodeling contractor and I'm remodeling somebody's kitchen or the bathroom or the bedroom and I'm doing these cool built-ins and, and, and freestanding pieces, it allows me to get my foot in the door and I control the project, I control the design, and it's all my yeah. ideas and my design. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm just a cabinet shop, People are bringing designers are coming to me and say, "Build this, build this, and build this." And I don't have the latitude. You know, basically, I lose the the um, the control of the design, and yeah. it's not my design and ideas. And mm -hmm. I get shot down because they like because the designers like to control their their cabinet guys. Of course. So. Yeah, yeah I know. I know a few who have, a few people who have that business model in different fields, and yeah, yeah, it does work. It's. It's a lot more work, or at least it sounds like a lot more work. Yeah. But, but it does give you that control, which having people come to you and ask you to make this particular table or, or cabinet or credenza or whatever. Yeah. You don't, you don't get that same freedom. Right, exactly. Now, th I will say this, though. You know, as I push, number one, over the years, as I've established myself as, as a fine furniture maker and, and, and fine woodworker, then and and great craftsmen, I'm getting more of that work without having to get the remodel to sell the remodel to get it okay. that rolled into the project. So mm -hmm. I'm getting more of that, and and I'd like to even yeah. push it a little bit further and harder so that it is pretty much just that. Because mm -hmm. I'm at a point where getting down on my knees and up on ladders, you know, it's just hard on my body. Mm -hmm. How many years have you been doing this, Todd? I've uh, been remodeling since '97. Uh, and and um, it was really it's been it's been a great ex fifteen it's years. been great for me because it's so much exposure to so many things in so many mm -hmm. people's houses, and and so it builds a volume a library of ideas in my head. 
Right. Yeah, of course it does. I mean, well, how long have you been at it? Um, f five, well, four years, four years since I started my business. Oh, okay, okay. I've been doing Google so, for a so bit longer, but I'm, I'm really starting to push, um, take, I'm starting to take it more seriously and starting to actually move forward with the business now. Well, now, Randy and, and Chris, how are you guys doing your finish work? What are, what are you using? Uh, Randy, you want, you want to take that first? Well, uh, we had talked about this a little bit before. You know, I, I use a, a very inexpensive uh, setup. My total investment in my spray outfit is about uh, like $150. I'll show you my, uh, my compressor. It's... Uh, wow. And you're obviously happy with the finish you're putting out, right, Randy? Yeah, and it, you know, so it's you know, pretty simple stuff here. You know, uh, um, this is a, a you know, a Home Depot you know uh, mm -hmm. job here. You know, and uh, so this is like a hundred dollars. You know, I showed my uh, sprayer before. It's it's like uh, it's a, it's a touch up gun, like thirty dollars. Uh, wow. And hose and and I'm on my mm -hmm. way. And and uh, you know, I my my projects are small. And uh, so it's right. uh, uh, cleaning the. I'm, I'm constantly having to clean the gun because I'm I move from uh, you know the die to the shellac to the, the right. finish. And and that's, the advantage with the touch up gun is that it, it you can clean it in about uh, you know four minutes or something like that. I mean it's right because there's right. very little liquid in there anyway. You know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's really. It's, it really says something that you can start spray finishing with such a, such a small investment. Yeah, you know, and, and the thing is, too, I mean, I will admit, some of that stuff works. I had even bought a, uh, a $90, $95, uh, like, gravity feed gun from uh, Lowe's, and, man, it barely got me through a single project, and I was like, this thing is so bad, and I, I ended up throwing it away. It just, it, it was like... It was just pathetic, I, you know. <laughs> it, it, but at the same time, you know, if you've got it working and it works, then, you know, yeah. it, it's not that it can't work. It, it certainly, my parameters for, for buying a tool are a little bit different. It has yeah. to work. It has to work reliably. And, and one of my goals as a business person is I have to reduce liability and I have to think, make things efficient. Both, both in my methodology and in, in my tools. So, so there's a little bit different way that I measure my, my investment and what I buy yeah. and my choices. Yeah. yeah, I haven't really settled on a finished approach. Um, I've done, I do, I have done it and I continue to do everything from uh, spraying with an HVLP gun, aerosols, rag, brush, um, what else is there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, uh, uh, one of the things I noticed too, uh, when I was trying to log on, um, uh, I noticed that um, uh, you were talking a little bit about uh, Matt about how you you fix your runs. Yeah, and I do the exact same thing you do. Pair them off with a chisel because sanding them just creates a bigger problem. Yeah, um, and after you pair them off and it's generally flat, then yeah. you lightly sand. And I'll use a, I'll use a razor as a mini scraper or yeah. use a chisel as a scraper as opposed to paring it off. Yeah. What I find is sometimes if I, I use it as a scraper because chisels make excellent scrapers. Yeah. But uh, I do the exact same thing you do. So you're you're right on target, man. Oh, and then it, you know one other thing though that that kind of helps after you pare it off or scrape it or chisel it off. Basically, if you take the solvent, whether it's shellac, you know, the solvent for shellac or, or lacquer, yeah. if you put a little bit of the solvent on your finger and, and rub it, you can yeah. kind of you can kind of melt the finish a little bit and get it to blend. So when your next coats go on, it'll cover it right up. Yeah, and of course you can't do that with a water-based finish. It has to be a a lacquer or shellac. Right. Yes. Unless, unless you have a big bottle of uh, acetone, alcohol <laughs> ether. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which a lot of people don't have. So. Now, would, I, would that actually work, Matt? I don't know if it would or not. Okay, that's that's what I was wondering. If you if you actually yeah. had had some of that, you know, and the thing is, too, I wonder if um, you know acetone itself might just uh, melt that enough. 
Acetone probably would. Yeah. And and the thing is it would flash off fast, so yeah. so um, Yeah, it might. It might. You know, because um, once once it melts yeah. it a little bit, you can manipulate it and smooth it out. It might take a little to, longer to dissolve it though. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how long it would take to, right. to get it to get it dissolved. Mm -hmm. Um I've found, I've had pretty good luck with um number one, spraying better so that I have fewer runs. Mm -hmm. But in the rare cases I have them, um, if I pair and then lightly sand and then just use a touch-up gun or if I've still got the finish in the gun, okay. just give it a light squirt. I'm usually usually good to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, On-site touch-ups um, over the top of my water-based Enduro bar with just a rattle can of deft or the pre-valve, the little pre-valve guns that have the jar on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, put the finish in there, and I can do just light touch-ups, and that that works fine. the 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 Enduro, the Enduro bar is a pretty hmm. a pretty good finish for water-based finish. Now, Matt, you don't have any issues with uh, seeing any lines between the different coats if you're not putting on a whole other coat. You can put on a partial coat, no problem. I I've I haven't had any problems, but it's 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 a it's a very light mist, right? Just over the sand, the light sanding marks I've made after repairing a um, a run. You know, I'm, all, all I'm really doing is trying to get droplets into the scratches. Right. Okay. So super super light mist, hmm. and and then I'm usually pretty good. And 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 the the like even putting the rattle can lacquer over the top of the the runs just worked absolutely perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing a lot of guys don't know of is like uh, I can go into my paint supplier, and and um, I can take in a uh, I'll take in my can of finish, and they'll take and pour. They can they can take uh, the the finish out of the can, put it in a rattle can for me, and so right. I have a right. rattle can for touch ups on a job site. Yeah. So I once I put a like a built in bookcase in. I can do a touch up if it gets scratched or something on site, and it's the exact same finish that I sprayed on it in the shop. Right. Now, are, are those as good as the ones that you can do yourself, that you can charge with your own air compressor? Oh, I don't know. I've never used those. However, the ones that they professionally load for me, and it's a pretty simple system. I've watched them do it in the, yeah. in the back of the store. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're great. They're perfect. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they work so good. <laughs> The spray pattern's nice, and and it's the same product as sprayed on, so there's yeah. no problem with compatibility. Have you ever tried those pre-valve guns where it's an, a charged aerosol container that screws to a, a basically a mason jar? No, I haven't. I've, you, I've you seen get, those. You can get them at Home Depot. About those. You can get them at Home Depot, and so you oh, really? can do that your, you can just do that yourself. Yeah, it's called a. Let me find a link for you. It's called a pre-valve touch-up gun. Oh, I I did, I've never seen them at Home Depot. I thought they were just a like a Woodcraft or, or Rockler. No, I, I can see, you can see them at Ace and and um, let's see here. What's kind of funny is I, I've over the years I've I've I don't experiment with finishes quite as much as I used to because because yeah. I found what works and it, you you know you guys may find yourself doing this you'll find what works and what you're comfortable with and and this is probably the most important thing and it's gonna the answer is gonna be a little bit different for everybody. So once you find the method and the, the products that work best for you, you'll mostly mm -hmm. stick with it because that's where you become very efficient and very effective with your finishing. Yeah, and the same you thing know. goes with building furniture too. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, because Matt, I know Matt, you you had you had asked me questions about the finish, and you yeah. chose your own path, and you seem to be having good success with it. And I I won't knock anybody for that. That's you know you're you're. You understand how that finish works. You're very familiar with it, and the familiarity also reduces liability. And I know that you're also doing some of this stuff for money as well. Yeah, and uh, and you know, I've got a system. I used to hate finishing. It was the it was the I had the most anxiety because that was that was typically the point where I ruined the project, right? And where I didn't know what I was doing, and it was frustrating, and I couldn't get the look I wanted, and so. Um, now I've got a system that I, I can confidently use and get predictable results in a short amount of time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, 
and if there are mistakes, I know how to fix them. Yep. So I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty stoked about that. That's cool. Free valve gun looks like. So can you see oh. that? There? Okay. So they sell they they sell a kit where you get the jar, and you get the charged aerosol gas on the top. Yeah. And then you can just go buy. You can go back and just buy the when the when the aerosol runs out. You can just buy more of those and snap them on. And so. Oh, that's interesting. I was introduced to those when I bought my house. There were some runs in the paint on the doors, and the painter came out, and uh, you know did the prep work on the wood to fix the runs, and then put the paint in there with some water, shook it up, and was good to go. Wow. So what's the cost of one of those versus an aerosol can So uh, for the refills, I guess? Um, it's interesting. I was just looking at the page. Let me turn off the screen share. Um, they have a... Um, okay, I want to just do... I want to not do screen share anymore. Am I back? You're back. Now I'm back. Okay. Um, you can get a 10 kit. Uh, let me see. It's um, the preval valve pack is the sprayer, two power units, eight buttons, four jar, four jars, four plastic jars, four three ounce jars. Eight lids, four dip tubes, sixteen long dip tubes for thirty-five bucks. So that kind of oh. sounds like it's a it's a mix-up pack. But you can get the fast pack. Let's see what the fast pack is. It doesn't tell you what the fast pack is. Oh, it's twelve replacement power units for seventy-five bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a couple of these, and I've and I've used them. Um, and the, the Preval company has lots, a lot of airbrush products and. And things like that, um, and a lightweight compressor for airbrushing. Um, but you know, when when you see a professional painter use it, you it's 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 kind of an endorsement a little bit, right? Yeah, sure. Because you know that a guy on a job yeah. site trusts it. He's walking into your home with this thing, and he's going to spray it, and he's not going to have any problems. So right. And you know, I find I can find them at Ace. You can find them at Home Depot, and I, I like the fact that they're readily available. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to check those out definitely. No. Well, now, um, what what are you um, favor? What finish are you favoring, Chris? Um, I'm still in the trial process. I'm trying to try everything. Um, I've been happy with every finish I've tried. Yeah. Um, except for pure tongue oil. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, between that, it's just they've all got their interesting different properties and. They're, they're just different. Um, I like sure. the water base because um, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't smell as much. But um, allows me to spray in the ba in the basement as opposed to my my yeah. actual shop, which is a, a um, separate from the house. Sure. Um, so they have all they have all got the benefits. I like uh, lacquer and shellac how fast they dry, especially in cold temperatures. Um, so they've all got their place. Um, I haven't f settled on one yet. Yeah. Well, and, and and that's the thing too. For what I particularly do, a lot of the a lot of the stuff I'm doing is for people's homes. It's bookcases and built-ins and things. And and I just want a pre-cat lacquer. I need something that's it's it's a it, it's it's geared towards production. And yeah. I I need it to dry fast. And you know the stains I'm using are wiping stains from M L Campbell's and Sherwin Williams, and they can go on and I can top coat them with a lacquer finish with pre-cat lacquers in 30 minutes. Yeah. So I am i don't, you know, and, yeah. you know, the Minwax and the bear stains that take like 24 hours to dry and... Those and are horrible. Those, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't use that. <laughs> if I don't have to. I don't use stains anymore. I use the, I use dyes. Yeah. yeah. It's just so much easier and so much better and... Yeah. Well, the... It, it, you know, what well, you got to realize too, if I'm matching something in somebody's house, it typically is an off the shelf stain or a stain, my stain's matching something that already yes. exists. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise, I'm pretty much, I'm very much either no stain because I want the wood to show or I'm, I like dyes because there's certain things you can do with them. Yeah. It, well, I'm preaching to the choir here. 
Yeah. yeah. I, I like when I, I recently my my last major project with these walnut mantles I did, and they knew they wanted them dark, and they were talking about stain, and I said, "We're not going to use stain. You want you want dark? We're going to use walnut." Right. Ah. Right. Uh, yeah. You're just going to use like, if you want dark, walnut. you're going to use dark wood, and and walnut's my favorite anyway. So I was pretty happy when I went and bought you know three or four hundred dollars worth of walnut. Yeah. So. I'm I'm posting a pressure pot video. What's that, Randy? I was wondering, uh, do you use both uh, uh, pigment stains and dyes? I wanted to show you. Uh, so I do, um, you know, mission style. Okay. And um, is that showing yet? No, not yet. I don't, there you go. Okay. There and I saw uh, this on yeah. your website. That's got the tile top, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I tried fuming once, and uh, um, boy, you know, I drove out the family, and so um, <laughs> yeah, what I like to do is, is, uh, you know, it, it, with this technique, you know, you uh, on, uh, you know, I use either white oak or red oak, and you just you know fill the grain with the uh, the pigment, and then you uh, dye it accordingly, you know, to the the uh, the tip that you want, and uh, um, you know, it, it, it comes out really well, and it's repeatable, too. Right. You know, the thing is this, too. As woodworkers, we're often doing things for the love of woodworking and to do it like they used to do it and all that. But to be honest, most people don't know what a genuine fumed finish looks like it, versus versus uh, a stained, fin, you know, right. a stained uh, project. So... You know, we're really, it's an exercise for ourselves that a lot of times the clients don't appreciate the way we do. So, yeah. you know, it's like I'm not going to get into fuming because I can, you know, with stain, yeah. if, it's, if it's applied and wiped off properly, it doesn't look like it's wiped on it, you know, and it's a very clean look. And you can get a, a look that's so close to the fumed look, uh, you know, it's like I, I, I'd rather do that. It's safer. Sure. Yeah, yeah, more controlled. Now let me ask you this, Randy. Um, on your furniture, are you buying uh, quarter sawn red oak much? So I use all veneer. Oh, do you? Okay. Uh, I um, I just uh, can't get rid of that uh, picture now that's going on there. There. Yeah. So um, um, you know. You know, uh, regular wood is just you know, too expensive, uh, and uh, you, I can't really find you know the you know the, the patterns I want and everything. Uh, you know, so I want quarter sawn, uh, you know, white oak, and so uh, I have a, a vacuum bag, and uh, I, I just get plywood and uh, uh, apply the, uh, the the veneer to that, and uh, I'm at it. And, that way, you know, I have a small shop, but I don't need a joiner or a uh, you know a leveler or anything and everything. I just wow, uh, uh, you know, all this that that table that I was showing here, that, that's all veneer, every bit really? of it. Yeah, well, the only place where it's not is the top. Uh, you know, when I have to do um, you know a, a contour or something like that, that's that's when I have to uh, you know use some regular wood. Sure. Now, what's your what system vacuum system are you using? It's just a, a vacuum bag, and then I have a, a a vacuum pump that I got off of eBay, and uh, you know, it works fine. Oh, okay, yeah. You are are you guys doing are the other guys doing much vacuum pressing or? I'm not yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Same here. Nothing. I'm not yet. I have done non vacuum press. Uh, you could call it veneering. With create with what I call creative clamping, yeah. <laughs> um, but I just I don't have a vacuum press set up yet. Man, I'm going to tell you guys, and Randy knows this. The vacuum press opens a whole new world. Oh yeah. And and I'm telling you, when it comes yeah. to veneer work, it's like cheating. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's some setup, you know, that's uh, required and everything, and you know that's it. That's a little painful. So you you know you I try right. to. You know, blow it through real quick and everything. And then when I do it, I, I have a sample right here of, uh, let me see if I can get into the. Uh, a little bit, little bit lower there. A little there bit you go. lower. Okay, That's there good we go. There. 
So this this right here is, is kind of the uh, uh, the process I go through. So okay. this right here is this you know regular uh, uh, you know plywood. And in fact, uh, this last competition that I entered into, um, for some reason it's. Are you? Can you still see this now? Because I can't see myself. For some no, I'm looking at you. Chat in the top left instead of screen share. Okay. Well, there we go. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm I'm starting to use uh, recycled materials. We have this uh, recycle place that's uh, near us. Uh, I live in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, uh, so I I get uh, uh, oak flooring, and it's it's like a like a dollar a piece or something like that. Yeah. Right. And uh, I don't know why it's doing that. And uh, so, anyway, I, I can you still see it here? Because I can't see myself. I see no, your project. Uh, yeah. Um, click screen share again. It should disappear. I'm okay. using this uh, thing called third or lower third. That's fine. That's your that's your the the line across with your name. Um, you want to click uh, screen share to turn that off. Is yeah? How did you get your name on there? With the uh, lower third Google Plus plugin called Lower Third. Oh, but I'm using the uh, the uh, capability in their custom overlay to, to show these things, and uh, mm -hmm. and that's that's where it's doing it. It's stuck oh, okay. On. You're you're not um, doing a screen share or something else, is it? Yeah. Okay. Oh well, but. Anyway, what I was trying to get to is that uh, you know what I've been experimenting with is just uh, you know trying to use as minimal amount of uh, you know full wood as I, yeah. I can. So I use a lot of the, the veneer. I make a very uh, 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 um, uh, you know a narrow cut you know for my profile, and then mm -hmm. I put the veneer right over that profile so that it blends in, and then I do my finishing on top of that. So I mean. <laughs> You know, I, I've been able to make some, you know, pretty good things, you know, for, uh, you know, pretty cheap. I mean, like this this uh, end table right here, you know, it's probably like, uh, I don't know, thirty dollars in, in wood. That <laughs> 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 looks cheap. cheap. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Well, fellas, well, we are way past seven o'clock, and um, I am still at the office, so we kind of need to wrap up. I think we should maybe. Uh, Talk about finishing more next week. Um, yeah, we're gonna probably move wood chat to 7 p.m. Pacific time. Um, Are we okay? Um, well, as I said, probably. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think. I'm on the I'm on I'm in the Eastern time zone now. I'm in Ohio. So, so what that's is that? 10. Um, 10 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. So is it 10:30 right now for you? Yes. Okay. So. Um, we're going to do that so that the Modern Workers Association can uh, do 6 p.m. Pacific, and we'll do 7. Uh, okay. We're going to we're going to coordinate with them, though, and we'll make an official announcement once we've done that. Um, but if you guys want to come back next week and talk about more finishing, I'm going to try and be in my shop so okay. I can so, show the portable spray booth and some of the products I use. So, so next week, Matt, you will be here for wood chat. Oh no, that's right. I'll be in Montana fly fishing. Are you serious? <laughs> I know, and and you know what, Todd? I always talk to my buddies about stopping by. Well, you know, I'm in Ohio now. They always punch me in the face. <laughs> uh, well, I'm We're not stopping. We're going to go straight to the fishing. We're going to get on the river that night. We're not stopping. We're sorry. You can, you can go do your woodworking thing later, but we're not stopping. So, yeah. But you, you know how close I am. From where, you, from where you guys get on the freeway, you could throw a baseball at my house. And if you couldn't hit it, it rolled to my property. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's how close I am. Well, anyways, I'm in Ohio. Chris, right, for the Chris next is right, though. I won't be around for Woodchat next week. i got to send Chris yeah. on, on yeah. how to get that set up, but I will okay. be back for the week after that. So. Okay. Um, and my schedule's real hit and miss because I've been busy. I'm, okay. I'm trying to get things. i got to get a lot of stuff done here so I can get back to Montana. Yeah. Okay. Well, I enjoyed having you guys, Randy and and, uh, and Todd, and and, and, uh, and you always, Chris. You're, you're always special to have around. So. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for helping uh, me get on, Chris. Up. Everybody awesome. kind of really just, quickly just said goodbye with chat. Yeah, yeah, I just sat down at the computer and my name popped up on uh, right. yeah. the email thing. Drag them in. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for hooking me up. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Uh, we'd like to get you back on again someday, Todd. Okay, cool. Hey, Chris, I love your work, though. I've been over and I look at your stuff, so uh, good luck with the business. You do some okay. nice stuff. Cool. It's a process, isn't it? I like your style. Yeah. Okay. All right. We, we got to go. All right, everybody. Okay, Wait, bye. All right, bye. We'll see you all next week. <laughs>